Welcome everybody. Welcome back to another one of my Powerbox series of videos. In this video, or part one of probably part two or possibly three videos, I'll be covering off the functions menu. The functions menu is quite complex, um, quite detailed, so I'll need at least one video to cover uh, most aspects of this particular menu. In part one of the menu, I intend to concentrate on the servo settings. And we'll probably uh, branch over a little bit into some of the other settings as well, but predominantly the servo settings is what I want to concentrate in part one. So, for our little example here, I've got two servos. Uh, basically, uh, the servo on the left is plugged into channel one or port one of my receiver, and the right hand side servo is plugged into port two or servo two. Now, let's have a look at our um, functions menu. Let's go into our functions menu. So, once we enter the uh, main menu structure, you'll notice the functions menus in the top left hand corner there. At the moment there's no functions defined. Now the functions menu is normally where we define all our flight surface controls. And not only flight surface controls, you might have say gear, lights, landing lights, takeoff lights, navigation lights. Um, pretty much anything you want to control is uh, programmed up in the functions menu. And that's why it's imperative that people have a very good understanding of how the function menu operates. It's very flexible and it's really the, uh, the heart of these radios. Anyway, let's move on. Let's create a function. So, here's our new function. The first thing you want to do is give it a uh, unique name. Now normally you might give it, say, a name like gear or throttle or aileron. It could be aileron left, right or, or for both ailerons, elevator. Um, lights, whatever. In this particular example, let's just call it function 1 because we're not flying a plane. And these surveys need to be defined and we'll define them in a second. However, let's define a control first. So let's have a look in the control menu, see what options are available to us. So of course we have the sticks. So we can program in a stick. I'm just moving my elevator stick and you can probably see the uh, up and down red arrows there flashing away. We can also um, assign the input to say a push button switch whether it's momentary or latching doesn't really matter we can also use a rotary control or rotary encoder we can use a slider so if I select my right hand slider you'll see it flashing away um, obviously another input device is a switch so I can select a switch to control the servos however for this example we're just going to go straight for my uh, elevator stick there's other inputs as well. We have virtual switches. So for instance, if you have a couple of virtual switches defined, you can use the logic output from the virtual switches to control a function, to control your servers. Um, same with telemetry. You can use the telemetry control to control the um, function. And then we have a fixed value option. So this fixed value option, you've got three options. You've got on, off, and the three dashes. And what that basically does, it basically drives the servo to one of three positions. And from there, we can offset it if need be. So the idea of having this fixed value is to allow us to set the servo to a fixed offset position. And then use uh, an input to control it from that offset position. Fairly simple. I'll go back to my stick C. So we'll use that for my example. Once we define the control, the next option along is the trim. So if, for instance, we were connected to some ailerons, you'd probably want some trim function for the aileron or trim control. And of course here I've just uh, activated my trim switch. And if we go into here, we can set the trim up. This is fairly self-explanatory. You probably won't need to explain that for most users. It's fairly simple. I'll just delete it because we won't need it for this particular example. This setup menu, I'll explain this in a lot further detail in part two of the video because this actually allows us to set a detailed curve a response for this function. So don't forget this function doesn't necessarily control just one servo, it control, can, can control up to 10 servos. And basically using these, this curve input here, we can modify the behavior of all those 10 servos with one curve. Uh, moving on, we have a whole File safe and hold setting. Uh, again, fairly self-explanatory. If you're in the hold position, servos just hold their position if you go into a uh, fail safe lockout scenario. 
Or if you want, you can drive the servos. You can teach a, a position for any of the servos and when you're in a lockout situation, the servos will actually go to that position and stay there until control is regained. Now, the last column, the servo column, the all-important servo column. So this is where we uh, allocate the servos to this function. So for my example, I've got the two servos. Let's connect servo one and two to this function. So being a core, I can select any of uh, the 26 servos here. And don't forget, there's a maximum of 10 servos uh, allowable to be connected to the one function. So for instance, if you had some humongous aircraft with uh, 10 servos per aileron, you'd throw all those 10 servos for say for the left aileron into a function called aileron left or, le or aileron or whatever, and then you'd have total control over each of those servos in these menus. So as we have our model here, we've only got the two servos. Now, one important thing is we can rename these servos. So in a lot of the menus within the core, it refers to the servos. However, the default name is actually just servo. So if I just give you an example, if we go into the servo monitor screen, you'll notice the uh, servo monitor working there. However, it's just labeled with the channels here. So we've got um, up to 26 servos or 26 channels and each one is just called servo. So that's not really all that useful. However, we can just, with a couple of clicks of the, uh, of the screen, we can change the name. So I'm just going to call that left servo for the left servo and the right one I'll just call right. So we now have a left and right servo in this function. Now, if you go to some of the other menu screens and whatever, for instance, I'll just go back to the monitor screen, you'll now notice the name has changed and that carries throughout the whole programming. So you'll see this left servo appear in other um, menus which makes it a lot easier to um, understand which servo is being selected for any of the menus. So again, there's our servo monitor controlling both left and right servos. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense. Okay, let's move on to slightly more important stuff where all our parameters or travel values and volumes are, are set for the servos. So you'll notice we have a limit value. So have a plus and minus limit value. This limit value is the hard stop for the servo. So once you set a limit here of say minus 125, the servo will never ever ever drive past that point, irrespective of what mixing is incorporated for that servo. So you can assign the same servo in another function or in one of the mixes, and you can drive it, try and drive it past this negative 125% point, but it will never exceed that value. So this is a hard limit. So it's really handy, for instance, where you have um, hard limits on your linkages or say, for instance, on a carburetor where you actually the servo has to physically stop before it hits the end stop. Uh, otherwise, you overdrive the servo. This is where you set it. So obviously, we've got a hard limit for both directions and that's fine. So that's pretty much the same as most other radios. Now, the next value is called way. Um, most other radios actually call it like travel adjust. So if, for instance, for Tarbo, I'm pretty sure we'll call it travel adjust. Spectrum is sort of similar. So this is basically your travel adjust. So at the moment we have plus or minus, say, 50% travel. And of course we can change this. So the default is 50. And the reason being in Powerbox's wisdom, they decided to default to 50 instead of 100 because if you insert these servos or install these servos in a brand new model, and you may have some new linkages attached. You don't really want to be overdriving the servos accidentally when you first turn power on and maybe flick a switch or move your uh, joysticks. So the reason being is they, they have a reduced throw just to protect your linkages. And it's easy enough to adjust it. Okay, so now we have plus or minus 100% throw. And you'll notice the servos now move a little bit further. They can move slightly off screen as well. But we have a lot more throw. The good thing about this screen is um, you can see where your hard limit is with the orange uh, points and then you have the green point or the green bar graph which shows you the relative output of the servo as I move the stick. And not only that, we do have an actual absolute figure of servo travel here and there for both servos. So you notice we've got minus 100 at uh, full throw in one direction, zero in the middle and then plus 100 all the way in the other direction. 
Now, let's have a look at this center adjustment because this is where it differs a little bit from most other radios. So you're probably used to a lot of other radios where you have a center adjustment point which sometimes is called sub trim where you can trim this value or change this value and it will move the servo center point around but it won't affect the end points, these plus or minus 100%. Powerbox do it slightly differently. So on the Powerbox radios it does affect the end points. So remember as I move the stick we've got minus 100 in one direction and plus 100 in the other direction. Let's have a look at centering these servos. So if I pick say servo, um, the left servo, you can see we can move the center point. So if I get it roughly vertical, it's about minus 10% offset. Let's do the same with the other one. There you go, they're close enough to negative 10%. So we've actually dialed in minus 10% throw to get the uh, center correct on both servos. Now keep an eye on this figure here on the, on the left hand side which is the absolute servo output. So at the moment you notice it's set to minus 10% because we've dialed in minus 10 which is fair enough. Now as I move the stick you'll notice we'll actually go past minus 100, uh, minus 100%. So there's minus 100, however I haven't quite reached the end of my stick travel and there's the end of my stick travel. So notice we've now moved from minus 100 to minus 110% because it's impacted the end point. So it shifted the end point another negative 10%. And of course the same is true for the other direction. So the other direction has actually reduced the travel from 100 to minus 90, uh, sorry, to plus 90. There you go, that's the end, end of my travel. So basically what it's done is adjusting this center point shifts the whole operating envelope of the of the servos to the left. If you dialed in positive 10, obviously it does it to the right. So just keep in mind this figure here also uh, uh, impacts the endpoints. Now, if you want a typical sub trim like you find on other radios, that's very easy to do as well. And I'll just quickly show you here how we do it and I'll come back to the screen as well. So basically what we do is we go into the curves for these servos and we edit the servo curve and what we do is we just edit the midpoint so let's pick on the left servo, so servo number one which is the left one I can adjust the center now however these are our endpoints there so if I move the cursor you notice the blue cursors on that last point there and on the other side and actually if I hold my stick down while I adjust the center, oops, so I'm adjusting the center now, but you notice the servo is not moving, so we're not impacting these endpoints. So all that does is change the center point, uh, the reference of the center point. So basically that's like a sub trim, exactly the same as a sub trim. Now I'll just go back to the previous menu and I'll come back to this. Okay, I'll just reset the curve. So we're in this menu here, we've got this servo here, uh, both servos working, however we want to change direction, not happy with the way they're going, one of them say backwards or whatever all you need to do is you notice where it says normal or norm here and you notice the little white arrow uh, in the top right hand corner that it indicates like a second function within this actual um, option so all you need to do is hold down your finger on this or in my case the stylus and it changes it to reverse so now you'll notice servo 2 is reversed in travel and simple as I can reverse servo 1 as well so now they're both moving but in reverse relative to my stick input simple as that I'll just put these back to normal so I don't forget okay so that pretty much explains this screen here it's reasonably simple the main thing to take away is the fact that you know the way is actually your travel adjustment and the center point adjustment also impacts the endpoints. Now let's have a look at the curves. So remember you can have multiple servos within this function. So the one function controls all these servos. However, what if we um, have two different servos or you want to match the travel of this servo to that one and we're not running a fancy power box inside the aircraft so we have no option of servo matching within a receiver. We can do it with the transmitter. All we need to do is enter the curves. So here is where we modify each servo's curve. So remember we've got a curve for each servo. 
The top value here, you notice it's set to minus 10%. That's our center adjustment. So that's exactly the same as uh, this value here. Oh, if I just reset it. So that center minus 10 is the same figure. So you can adjust it here as well. As a matter of fact, we're currently looking at the servo curve here. And um, I can actually move the whole curve up and down. And if you look at the endpoints, which are basically this bit here and that bit there on the curve, you'll notice they're moving as well. And that's what I was saying about adjusting the center point. We are adjusting the endpoints as well. Okay, so what are we looking at here? This is actually the curve of the servo, the servo's curve. So at the moment, we've just got a straight linear line. As a matter of fact, if we edit the servo curve, so this is the actual curve of the servo. Let's put, say, a couple more points in here. Oh, by the way, we can have like a ridiculous number of points. However, for this example, I might just go for the nine option. And let's, um, let's play around with some of these just to make, I'll leave the center one as per normal. Just do something silly like that. We have a smoothing function as well. Give it a bit of more rounded sort of look and response. So now, remember we had a straight line here. However, now we have a weird wiggly line and then it flatlines. So that flat line area, that's actually our limit points. So remember how we set the limits to plus or minus 125%. So that value there's 125%. That's all that is. So there's our servo curve. So basically, now remember this is only for the left servo. So the right hand side servo, servo 2 still has a linear curve. So let's see what happens. You notice I'm moving the stick and then servo 1 starts to accelerate. If I go the other way, it goes in the reverse direction because of the servo curves going reversed. And if I, oops, a bit of overlap there. But yeah, so you can see the response is all weird because I've put in a weird curve. So that's fairly self-explanatory, hopefully. I'll just go and reset this curve back to a straight line. So now that it's a straight line, you also notice the blue cursor on the screen. So that's my relative stick position. Simple as that. So that's where I'm holding the stick. And the orange line is telling us where the uh, servo output is. Simple as that. Okay, we also have a function curve. So we can view the function curve. So where, where's this function curve? Well, the function curve is actually set back a couple of screens. So back in the main function menu, we, remember how I was saying we can set up a curve for the function which impacts all the servos? So here's the curve here, it's set to um, a linear response at the moment, plus or minus uh, 100%. I'll just quickly edit this. Like I said, I'll explain this in uh, more detail in the um, other menu. But let's go to a nine point curve and I might just change, uh, say that point, and then go down on that point, do a bit of a zigzag. And smooth it out as well. So remember this is the function curve. So we've set this up under here. We're going to the servo curve now. Let's have a look at servo number one or the one that's on the left. The servo itself has a linear curve. However, the function curve for this servo is now a squiggly line, which is what we said in that other previous screen. Now let's look at servo number two. So have a look at servo number two. You notice we have the same function curve. And that's because the function curve impacts all servos within that function. So if we had 10 servos in here, they would all follow this response. Now, um, what else can we do? We can have a look at the result curve. So we have a servo curve. This is a bit confusing, but we do have a servo curve. At the moment, it's just a linear line. Then we have a function curve. So remember that function curve is that weird squiggly one. And then if we add the straight line with the squiggly one, this is the result. So the, the core and atom allows you to see the result of the curve. So basically, both servos are moving here and they've got like a weird response. So I'm just moving the stick up and down. But the servos are behaving a bit erratically. So the servo, servo should just be going from right to left and left to right, but they're sort of in the middle of the stick travel. They're going backwards and forwards a bit. And that's because they're responding to the function curve. So not the servo curve, but the function curve. However, let's throw another spanner in the work. So we've got the function curve, which is impacting both servos. 
let's go back into here. So we're in servo for the left hand servo. We're in the uh, servo curve for that. Now let's set up the actual servo curve for this. So let's say put a couple of extra points in here. Um, let's move this guy up. Let's move the next one down. I'll leave the center one where it is. We can move that one up. So I'll just do a real crazy curve, smooth. So now we have an even more of a squiggly line for the servo curve. So when we select servo curve, we're looking at this curve that I just programmed in, and that's only for the left-hand servo. So remember, this is the servo curve specific to this servo. So if we go to say servo number two, and look at the servo curve for that, it's a straight line. However, for um, number one, it's a weird squiggly line. And don't forget, we now have a function curve, as, or we still have that function curve, I should say, for both servos. And let's have a look at the resulting curve. So if we add the servo curve to the function curve, what do we get? We get sort of a weird response as well. So I'll go back to servo curve, and let's have a look at the result curve. So this is going to be our servo output for servo number one, not servo number two. So if I move the servo, so servo number one goes a bit crazy, and you'll notice it's responding a lot weirder compared to servo number two. I can't really go the way because the sticks will hit each other. But basically it's trying to follow this curve. Um, just to make it easier to follow, I might just go back to servo number two. Well, actually, we'll go back to the functions. And let's get rid of the, cur the weird curve and the functions. Let's make that a straight line. So we do that just by hitting reset. So now our function curve is just a straight line. And we now look at servo number two. We've got a straight line for the servo curve, a straight line for the function curve. So the result should just be a straight line. And just be aware these uh, values on the, um, on the X and Y axis that change. So this is showing us a curve between basically roughly, if I move the cursor down, um, about minus 100% travel. And if I go the other way, unfortunately the other servo is hitting me, that should go to 100% as well. So servo number two should just be responding normally. And if I move the stick, you'll notice servo two sort of looks normal. However, servo number one has got of like... Um, accelerated travel, and that's because of the curve that's only impacting um, servo number one. So this is the actual servo curve for number one, and we can modify that again. Um, if I make it linear, for instance, so if I just delete it, or reset it, I should say, that's now gone back to a linear response. If I look at the resultant curve, and now both should track exactly the same again, because now they both have exactly the same curves, which are a straight line. So I suggest you play around with the curves a fair bit. It's um, quite handy to have a good understanding of the curves. Now, we do have some other values down here. So you'll notice down here we've got some values. So we've got some X, we've got an F figure, a servo figure, a mix figure, and an F plus mix. So what these are are basically the absolute values for different things. Like for instance, the X gives us the actual stick position. So if I move the stick all the way down, I get minus 100. If I go the other way, I get plus 100. And it's the same with the function curve. So remember the function curve is now a straight line. So this box here shows us the relative output of the function curve. Now at the moment being a straight line, it should read exactly the same as the X parameter, which it does. And then we have this yellow box here with SRV written in it. So this gives us the absolute servo position at all times. So remember we have an offset for the center of negative 10%. So I'm not touching my stick at the moment and you notice I've got negative 10 there. If I move the stick all the way in one way, I've got negative 110% travel. And the other way is plus 90, uh, factoring in that negative 10% center adjustment. The mix figure here. So the mix basically has um, a value where it incorporates any mix. So if we had a mix program that was affecting this particular server or function, you'll notice there'll be a, a, a numerical indicator there following the mix curve because you can set up a curve in the mixes. And then we have an 
f plus mix, which is function plus mix. So if you have a mix curve, you have a function curve, and if you add them both together, this, is, this gives us the absolute output of the function and the mix added together, if that makes sense. Again, these values are pretty handy. I, I use them a fair bit when setting up an aircraft, so because um, it gives you the absolute values for most of the parameters, it's particularly this servo. You can look at this servo value there straight away, and you can see where your stick is, and if you have any weird curves and that, they're incorporated as well. Simple as that. Okay, I think I pretty much explained that as much as we can go. Now, I'll cover this a little bit more in the other video, in part two. Let's reset the curve. So we've just got a basically plus or minus 100% travel again. Let's see what happens when we add another function. So, here's one of the uh, nice uh, features of the core and atom transmitters. Let's make a function 2. Oops, I'll just call it F2. Saves me typing. So we've got function 2 there. Let's put function 2 on my left hand slider. So I'll just select that. And we'll select servos 1 and 2 again. So the left servo and the right servo. And let's have a reduced throw of say, oops, wrong way. Let's make it say 20% in both directions. Neg 20 and positive 20. And we'll still keep the same center, of course. Actually, that's something I'll need to explain as well in a second. So now we have two functions. So if I move my elevator stick, we can move the servos. And now if I move the slider, we can also move the servos. However, the slider only moves them plus or minus 20%. And basically, you know, no matter where the uh, elevator drives them, the slider can still control them as well. So what we have here is a form of mixing, but without introducing any actual mixing. And don't forget, we can uh, now apply new, travel, uh, new travels for the servo or servo throws, new curves, as well as a function curve, which is independent of the first function. So you can see we can set up some quite complex setups, like for instance, you can easily set up crow, butterfly, and stuff like that. We can even set up a switch here, for instance. So let's make a function three, I'll just call it F3. Let's select a switch, three position switch. And we'll just select one servo this time. And we'll just leave that default throw. So what happens now? So that switch controls that. However, I still have control with my um, elevator stick and I still have control with my lever as well. So again, we've got three functions. The servos are mixed together with the three inputs basically. However, we have done no mixing. It's basically the functions that are incorporating these features. As a matter of fact, you hardly ever use um, uh, the mixing menu function, uh, sorry, the mixing menu, you tend to use a function menu more. The mixing menu is also used for some other parameters, um, for some other features, but nine times out of 10, you can achieve it within the function menu. Now, one quick thing before I finalize this video, I've been talking enough, um, just remember that the limit and the center values are global parameters. So if we alter them, say for this function, function number one, I might change the center to say, zero back to zero for both and I might change these limits say we increase the limits to something silly what will happen these will automatically increase in the other menus as well for the same server so if we go to say to the second function now function two you notice the limit and the centers have changed as well so don't forget they're a global parameter the limit center uh, plus or minus limit in the center are global parameters however the travel volume or the travel amount, travel adjustment, is not global. So that can be set individually for each function. Okay, that's enough from me from this video. We'll talk later again in the uh, second part. Thanks for watching.